Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Bihadi Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Bihadi Radha Madhava Kunja Bihadi Gopi Jana Balabha Yidi Vradhadi 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 Jatsodanandana Brajajanaranjana Jatsodanandana Brajajanaranjana Dana Brajajanaran Jamuna Tira Brajadi Jamuna Tira Vanachadi Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hadi Madhava Kunjabi Hadi Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hadi Vishnupad Paramahamsa Paridagacharaja Astatara Satsa Si Simat His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Shida Prabhupada Ki Anantakoti Vaishnavarinda Ki Granthuraj Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Gaur Primanandi Could you give this to Maharaj? Yes, him. There's an extra book. You, I've got one. You've got one. Extra one. Well, then you can read the purport and verse, too. You don't have to. You don't have your glasses. Okay. Too bad. Trying to help. Trying to be a Vaishnav. Trying, I'm trying. Well, I don't know about that. But you can't, I give you the book that you can't read, so. Hare Krishna. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Text 25, Canto 10, Chapter 3 These are Devaki's prayers Birth of Lord Krishna Nashte loke dvi prarardha vasane Mahabhutesh vyadi bhutam gateshu Vyakte vyaktam kala vege nayate Bhavan eka shrishate shesha sangya Nashte loke dvi parardha vasane Mahabhute shvadi bhutam kate shu Vyakte vyaktam lakala vege nayate Bhavan ekak shishnate shesha sangya
Ladies, Nashte locate me paradavasane. Nashte, after the annihilation, loke, of the cosmic manifestation, devi parada of asane, after millions and millions of years, parentheses, the life of Brahma, Mahabhoteshu, when the five primary elements, earth, water, fire, air, and ether, Adi Bhutam Gateshu, enter within the subtle elements of sense perception, Vyakte, when everything manifested, Avyaktam, into the unmanifested. Kala Vegena by the force of time. Yate enters. Bhavan, your lordship. Ekaha, only one. Shishyate remains. Ashesha Sangya, the same one with different names. Translation, after millions of years at the time of cosmic annihilation, when everything manifested and unmanifested is annihilated by the force of time, the five gross elements enter into the subtle conception, whatever that is. And the manifested categories enter into the unmanifested substance. At that time, you alone remain and you are known as Ananta Sheshanag, purport by Srila Prabhupada. At the time of annihilation, the five gross elements, earth, water, fire, air, and ether, enter into, that's the subtle conception, that's what that is, they enter into the mind, intelligence, and false ego, ahankara, and the entire cosmic manifestation enters into the spiritual energy of the Supreme Personality Godhead who alone remains as the origin of everything. The Lord is therefore known as Shesha Naga or Adi Purusha and by many other names. Paragraph. Devaki therefore prayed, quote, after many millions of years when Lord Brahma comes to the end of his life, the annihilation of the cosmic manifestation takes place at that time. The five elements, namely earth, water, fire, air, and ether, enter into the Mahatattva. The Mahatattva again enters by the force of time into the non 
manifested total material energy, semicolon. The total material energy enters into the energetic pradhan, and the pradhan enters into you, therefore, after the annihilation of the whole cosmic manifestation, you, you alone remain and with your transcendental name, form, quality, and paraphernalia. So continuing, Prabhupada's summarizing or paraphrasing Dev Devaki's prayer, quote, My Lord, I offer my respectful obeisances unto you because you are the director of the unmanifested total energy and the ultimate reservoir of material nature. My Lord, the whole cosmic manifestation is under the influence of time, beginning from the moment up to the duration of the year. All act under your direction. You are the original director of everything and the reservoir of all potent energies. I'm supposed to end the class at 8.15. But it looks like you're a little flexible here. Kirtan was a little more than flexible. Pretty ecstatic. Expandable. So I'm going to go a little bit longer than your normal schedule, if that's all right with you. Um... Many things, I'll just try to put them in little bullet points or sound vibration bites. Um, one of the main things that's being stated here by Devaki is one of the four essential verses of the entire Srimad Bhagavatam called the Chachor Sloki verses. If you're not familiar with what that is, there are four verses found in Canto 2, Chapter 9, where the essence of Srimad Bhagavatam is presented in four verses. And one of those four verses is what Devaki is saying. And it's Aham Evasam Evagre, Nanyad Yat Sadasad Param. So the topic is param, that the topic of the whole Srimad Bhagavatam is para-dharma, and para-dharma is meant to reach param, meant to reach the, the Supreme. So, in that verse, uh, Lord Vishnu states to Lord Brahma, in Gopal Tapani Upanishad it says, Krishna says to Lord Brahma, but either way, um, essentially, before the creation, I alone exist. During the period of cosmic manifestation, I alone exist. And after cosmic annihilation, guess what? I alone exist. He's not teaching impersonalism. He's teaching something else. He's teaching according to great acharyas describing what, how Vyasa is composed, um, the Sanskrit term is shakti parinamavad, that is, the Vaishnav teaching or the teaching of Srimad Bhagavatam or Vyasadeva's teaching is shakti undergoes various transformations <clears throat> and the source of the Shakti and the transformation is one, Aham, the person, Supreme Person. So the Supreme Person has potencies. Note, impersonalists say no. Bhagavatam says yes. The Supreme has everything. If you were to say there's something the Supreme cannot have, what have you done? You've reduced the Supreme to something he cannot have. So, in fact, not only he can have, he does have, in fact, 
He is the source of everything. And Deva Ki is recognizing that. She's specifically speaking about annihilation. And so now I'm going to, this is another sound bite. Annihilation is one of the ten topics of Srimad Bhagavatam. I'm going to be, pardon me, but I'm going to share with you a little of Tattva Sandarbha because I've been absorbed in Tattva Sandarbha. And the BBT did publish it, so it's, it's authorized. Uh, in the second part of Tattva Sandarbha, called Prameya Kanda, there is this very interesting language that Jiva Goswami used which sounds very similar to what we know in ISKCON, Sambandagyan, you know, the, the relationship between living entities and the Supreme, in fact, the relationship of everything with the Supreme because everything comes from the Supreme, so what's the relationship of everything with the Supreme? That's what we know as Sambandagyan. Jiva Goswami uses the word slightly differently. The same root meaning is there, but he, he uses the word Sambandi, with a different ending, Sambandi Tattva. That is to say, there's the book, that's the principal pramana, the means of evidence, a means of knowing something. And then there's a relationship between the subject of the book and the book. You with me? There's the book, that's Srimad Bhagavatam, that's the principal Pramana, that's the first section. Then he goes into what does, what's the subject matter of the book, the relationship of the subject of the book and the book. You can, you can give some anecdotal examples of, you know, uh, it, there's the Bhagavad Gita. And some people say, impersonalists say, the subject of Bhagavad Gita is the impersonal Brahman. So, Jiva Goswami, without other examples, Jiva Goswami is saying the subject matter of this principal text, Srimad Bhagavatam, is the best of all means of knowing anything, certainly anything transcendental, is Srimad Bhagavatam. What's the subject matter? The Sambandi Tattva, the relationship of the subject and the book. So he, in this third section, excuse me, the, the Pramana, Prameya section, one of the topics is if we want to know what the Srimad Bhagavatam subject matter is, we ask its speaker. And the speaker is Shukadeva Goswami. And Shukadeva Goswami identifies the ten subjects. That's what the Bhagavatam is about, and that's the relationship of the, of the subject with the text. I'll just do a little fast forward because it's, it's, it gets a little intricate and delicate. Maybe not good for a you know, Bhagavatam class, short bullet point. But there's ten topics. One of them, that the final one is Ashraya, Jiva Goswami says. The other nine are illuminating and elucidating and expanding about the one. In fact, the one is the Ashraya of the other nine. And he goes through it and says this one, that one, that one, this one, that one, that one the other one. Every one of them is some aspect of ashra, because ashra is the shelter of everything. What Devaki is saying is one of those ten, one of the nine. So in, in the Sanskrit, it's nashte loke, after the annihilation of the cosmic manifestation. So, annihilation is one of the nine topics. And obviously, there's a connection with Ashraya, the tenth one. And, you know, because everything comes from that one and everything enters back into that one. He's the Ashraya of the cosmic annihilation. And there's different parts. There's material energy and there's the living entities. You know, another two of the nine topics is creation of Vishnu and the sub-creation of Brahma, who gets the power and the plan and the map and the and creative potency, which is another topic of the nine. It all comes from 
ashraya, it comes from the one. So this one is, everything enters back into the one. That's the cosmic annihilation. And it's describing it very briefly in a prayer. Now, a little elaboration on this. Again, pardon me, a little Tattva Sundarbha appreciation. Um, there's two lists in Srimad Bhagavatam of the ten topics. One is found uh, in the beginning of the tenth chapter of Canto 2. Shukadeva Goswami lists the ten. And when he touches on annihilation, uh, the term is nirodha. Nirodha, and the word for word is going back to Godhead. But you follow a few verses later, and Naroda says something else. Naroda is the winding up of the cosmic manifestation. Look what, look what Devaki is speaking about. Nashte, <laughs> loke, the winding up of material creation. She's, under, she's, she's a learned person. She's a smart lady. But she's not, you know, a great scholar. But how do, so how does she know stuff that great scholars know? She knows through bhakti. Same as Queen Kunti in her prayers. She, very humbly, she's not deprecating herself or, you know, low self-esteem or something. She's comparing herself to great learned transcendentalists. Muninam Amalatmanam. Muninam Amalatmanam. Munis, great transcendentalists, who Amala Atmanam, who have become purified. Amala Atmanam. They're not Amala Bhaktas, they're Amala Atmanams. They're persons who have become purified by the quality of discriminating matter and spirit. Kunti says, my dear Lord, you have descended to give bhakti to those people. Like Chukadeva Goswami, like the four Kumaras, or like so many other personalities who have become purified. Because the discrimination between matter and spirit allows liberation. We'll say the opposite. Not making that proper discrimination, the default position is that the living entity, paro p, although transcendental, manute, they think that they're a product, trigunam, triguna amala, they're, they're, they're a product of the three modes of material nature, that's what they think they are, through the agency of false ego. I am this body. No, chapter 2, Bhagavad Gita. So, to move away from that position, those that don't have bhakti, they want purification, they want relief, they want brahmananda, and so they become purified by that. It's a very arduous process, very severe, and, and quite artificial, but the power of the intellect is to distinguish between matter and spirit. Krishna comes to deliver those people. Kunti says, and she compares herself to them and says, so how is it possible for They don't understand you. How is it I can understand you? Well, hint, she understands because of bhakti. Another big hint, she's very humble. She doesn't feel herself qualified, although she's eminently qualified. She's eminently qualified through the power of bhakti. She not only has disconnected herself from identification with matter, she's gone beyond that and strongly identifying herself with Krishna and her love and full devotion to Krishna. She has unstoppable love for Krishna. And because of that, many truths about Krishna are disclosed to her. So, similarly, Devaki, very, very qualified. She's presenting herself as not, because that's how, uh, that, that's, 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 according to Sanatan Goswami, very nice description in Brihat Bhagavatam, that's a, an evidence of humility. You know, the, 
Narada searching for the greatest recipient of Krishna's mercy, that whole part one. And he comes to the position of each person saying, no, 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 I'm not qualified, not qualified, not qualified. And Sanatana Goswami says, this is a symptom of qualification, where it's a symptom of humility, is a necessary qualification for understanding beyond your limited faculties, the Muni Nam folks, going beyond the ascending process of knowing things is humility. And the symptom, a symptom of humility is, although one may be very qualified, he writes, to perform a particular activity, one feels not qualified to perform that activity. That is to say, I'm fully dependent upon the mercy of Krishna. I'm fully dependent upon the mercy of Krishna. Bhaktivinoda Thakur teaches this in Sharanagati, where the, the, the entering into the surrender unto the Supreme Lord, we just discussed this over the 4th of July weekend in Chicago. Maharaj was with us in Chicago for that nice experience. One can no longer consider oneself able, what to speak of, deliver oneself, even understand ABC on the strength of one's own qualification. We have some faculty. That faculty alone is insufficient. Without, you know, an object can be before the eyes and you can't see if the power of seeing is taken. <laughs> we're dependent to utilize whatever faculty we're given. We're dependent. And so, surrender and humility says, I can't, I can't accomplish anything on, on my own qualification. That's the mood of a pure devotee and a, one who can know Krishna. In fact, tattva that, that, that that principle of surrender must be there. So, um, back to Shukadeva Goswami's term for annihilation is nirodha and then Sutta Goswami in Canto 12 chapter 7 he gives another list of 10 it's basically the same he just has some terms changed and his term is sangstha sangstha um, annihilation so Back to Tattva Sandar, Bhajiva Goswami says, these ten topics are the topics of Srimad Bhagavatam. One is the shelter of the other nine, and these are disclosed sometimes in philosophical discourse, like happens in the twelfth canto in regards to annihilation, very detailed. And in the third canto, Bhagavatam, twice, very, very, you know, tiring, <laughs> exhaustive detail. It's those sections that commonly devotees want to skip over because it's like, you know, I, I can't, it's, it's too tedious. Some more stories, please. But it's, it's, it's one of the, these are two, creation and annihilation. It's two of the ten topics. So Devaki's not giving elaborate. She's just touching on it. And touching on it, says, I surrender to you because you're the source of everything. During cosmic manifestation, you are everything. And after annihilation, you are everything. Everything is wound back up into the body of Mahavishnu. And some of the detail is there. The, you know, in the annihilation phase, there's these five. Whoops, the verse is gone. Um, no, Mahabhuteshu, Mahabhuta, the, the five principal elements. There, there's two things that are said in the verse and then in the purport. So in the verse, it is said, they enter into the subtle conception, the subtle conception. And in the purport, it says, um, mm, 
what does it say? It, yeah, they enter within the subtle elements of sense, sense perception, adibhutam kateshu. So there's, you know, in the process of cosmic manifestation, when an element comes, there's the sense that perceives the element. So apparently one of them is the, the sense, not like, you know, an eyeball, but the, the, the power to see comes along with the object of sight. So the elements enter into the sense perception, subtle capacity, and then that enters, goes on into pradhan. Now there's another, looking at Druta Karma. Druta Karma, could, could you understand this little, let me read that little section and maybe you can comment something on, on Reading in the second paragraph of the purport, Prabhupada is paraphrasing Devaki's prayers. The five elements enter into the Mahatattva. The Mahatattva again enters by the force of time into the non-manifested total material energy, which I understood to be Pradhan, but he's making a distinction. The total material energy enters into the energetic Pradhan. and the Pradhan enters into you. Therefore, after the annihilation of the whole cosmic manifestation, you alone remain. So what is that intermediate, by the force of time, the Mahatattva enters into the non-manifested total material energy, semicolon, the total material energy enters into the energetic Pradhan. What's that intermediate step? The best thing would be to have a definite statement from Guru, Shastra, or Sadhu that would directly answer the specific question. Nothing springs to mind right okay. at the moment. But there is a state of the Mahatattva where everything is in equilibrium. So that might be the intermediate state. In equilibrium, are the elements separated or not separated? <clears throat> uh, that sure. is, they may be, this is just speculation, like I said, the, the best thing would be to have a definite state. Okay, we'll, pa we'll pause on that one. But one could speculate then that they're there, they're separated, but they're not interacting. Mm. Fantastic. Because there is a state like that. They separate, but they're not interacting yet. In the process of creation, it's very, very clear. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I recall some statement like Thank you. that. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, so what? <laughs> well, the so what is, um, the message of Srimad Bhagavatam is these ten topics, one of them being the shelter of all of the others, and when one knows that, like, you know, the first of the Chatra Sloki verses of Bhagavad Gita. When one knows that, what do you do? You surrender. If you're an honest person, if you're a dishonest person, you'll do something else. Or you'll argue against it, no. Aham sarva prabhavo matak sarvam pravartate iti matva pajante mam. What else are you going to do? Iti matva, thus knowing. So, Devaki is knowing. And, and therefore I surrender unto you. She's giving, the, 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 the purpose of hearing all these things is impetus for surrender. Like Prabhupada would say, um, 
They say that God is great, but they do not know how great he is. That they do not know. So the more you know how great Krishna is, it gives impetus to surrender. So that, and, and that's just a, a secondary feature of Krishna, what to speak of the primary, meaning his position. His position, like, you know, the president or the minister, or, you know, it's a, it's a title. The media will have an interview with the president, they address him as Mr. President. But, you know, he has a name. God has a name, and there's names that indicate his position. And there's names that indicate his loving relationships with the personnel, with, with his devotees, and his activities. And the Bhagavatam is disclosing that, as well as his position, because his position is part of that. That is from him. He is the source of all those things. Now, one last thing is... We're not going to hear something like this from Mother Jasoda. It doesn't mean she's, her bhakti is less, because now Devaki knows things that Mother Jasoda doesn't know. So her bhakti must be better, because through bhakti one gets disclosure of different... But, so there's this whole other subject matter in the Bhagavatam and through the agency of our acharyas, especially Rupa Goswami having been so instructed by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the, the science of rasa. Krishna discloses to the residents of Vrindavan his position as the source of everything, the all-powerful and, you know, the position. It bounces. They, you know, it, it's covered by their intensity of intimacy of love. They can't see it. Kunti can see it, Devaki can see it, Bhishma Dev can see it, the Pandavas can see it, the resident of Vrindavan can't see it, although Krishna discloses it, because it's a very, very special place, very special feature, just like the goddess of fortune. This nice discussion between Mahaprabhu and Venkatabhata. Why the goddess of fortune? She's the most chaste. So why did she leave the side of Narayan and go to enter into the rasa dance of Krishna? Doesn't sound chaste. And Venkatabhata said, there's no lack of chastity. Narayan and Krishna are the same. There's no deviation from the chastity of Lakshmi. Mahaprabhu, very well. Then why did she have to undergo austerity if they're the same? And not only she went, underwent austerity for a long time, she was unable to enter into the rasa dance. If they're the same, why is that? I don't know. <laughs> it's this rasa issue. Because she's thinking, I'm the goddess of fortune, let me enter the rasa dance. But she doesn't have the right mood. She has the, the Aishvarya bhav and doesn't have the Madhurya bhav. It's a... It's a it's subtle. For those that are not Gaudiya Vaishnavas, it's bewildering, more than subtle. And it's, it's part of the message of the Bhagavatam. One last philosophical point I just wanted to share, which is some appreciation from Jiva Goswami, who, by the way, the Sachincha Beta Beta Tattva terminology didn't exist during Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's times. My understanding is Jiva Goswami gave the term. And to describe Mahaprabhu's teachings, which are the teachings of Srimad Bhagavatam or the teaching of Srimad Bhagavatam or Mahaprabhu's teachings, either way, works. And that is there's this relationship between non-difference and difference simultaneously and that teaching permits us, it's the, the scriptural foundation, philosophical foundation for bhakti. Because otherwise, 
what's the philosophical basis for us to do what we do? You know, this camera that's up there and the flat screen that's over there and, you know, we're using the material energy in all kinds of ways, the printing press and microphone and we're using the material energy like anything. How do we get away with it? Because, because of what David is saying. It has its relationship, inextricable relationship with the personality of Godhead. It's not the personality of Godhead, but when connected to the personality of Godhead, spiritual potency is restored. It's a very important, I'll say it again, a very important underpinning of our philosophical justification for devotional service. Being in the world, but not of the world. And if we don't understand the philosophy properly, we can get messed up. We can start trying to own the property and you get messed up. It's not our property. It's Krishna's property. The ability that you have, the facility to have, the paraphernalia they have, is Krishna's property. And therefore we're justified to use it in Krishna's service. Anasaktasya vishayan yatarham upayunjitaha Again, Rupa Goswami. According to suitability, one person's suitability is not another person's suitability. What's, what's appropriate for a sannyasi is not appropriate for a grahasta, and vice versa, etc. Et and even from one grahasta to another grahasta. According to suitability. And, and the measure of suitability is what's going to take care of my necessities, at the same time facilitate my engaging in no other shelter but Krishna position. Prabhupada gave so much resource to, excuse me, Krishna gave so much resource to Prabhupada because there was no attachment and he could engage it in Krishna's service in an unalloyed way. I remember sitting, that's Prabhupada's story in Ireland. Um, one year, uh, maybe sir, you were in the room. One year, the, the, the Radha Damodar party went to, to my port, all ensemble. Huh? 76? 75? I think it's 75. I, well, the, my memory was of this. Prabhupada arranged for a special darshan. And so, you know, the Radha Damodar party crowded into that little room and Prabhupada was in the back and he waited till we were all settled and he came out. And I, I was sitting like right at the corner, just, you know, just watching Prabhupada and very dramatically Tamal Krishnamaraj put a whole stack of hundred dollar bills on the corner of his desk. I was watching Prabhupada's eyes and his eyes didn't even go to the stack of hundred dollar bills. He just was talking about this and that and the other thing, but he wasn't unaware. When, he, when the darshan was over, he stood up, told his secretary audibly, you know, you, something to do with printing, I don't recall the detail, and then he stopped and said, and do you think we can have some uh, honey with the sweet rice? And laughed, meaning, you know, some sense gratification, it was a joke. <laughs> At least I took it that way. The, you know, it's, it's all for Krishna's service. You can't buy with money. You can't buy favor of the spiritual master. He's detached. You can make an offering to the spiritual master. That's nice. He'll accept. Don't think you can purchase his favor by money. No way. You can offer something. And with detachment... He'll engage that in Krishna's service. Yatarham upayunjitaha anasaktasya vishayan without attachment. That's bhakti. That's bhakti. That's the detachment of bhakti. Attachment to Krishna. And whatever comes is for Krishna's service. And that's the teaching. It doesn't matter ashram, it doesn't matter what you're, it doesn't matter anything. That's the principle that we live by. And one who understands that has this wonderful facility of being connected to Krishna with 
just like this sign, the joy of devotion. The banner over here, very nice. The joy of devotion. The happiness is whatever Krishna gives you, you offer it to Krishna. He doesn't need anything. Offering a palm full of Ganges to the Ganges. What does the Ganges need? A palm full of Ganges? It's the, it, the benefit goes to the person that's making the offering. That's the joy of devotion. And the philosophical basis for it is it's all Krishna's. In that sense, in the, in the oneness sense, it's all Krishna. But it's all Krishna's. And we offer it to Krishna. That's the joy of devotion. And we have the philosophical basis for it. Therefore, Devaki is saying, I surrender unto you. Okay, I went past my time. Go right. ahead, Archita. Maharaj, this is the deepest collection of sound bites ever assembled. <laughs> you said you were just going to give us sound bites. What a de deep collection of sound bites. Now, there, there's something that seems a little incongruous, and maybe you can touch on this, because you, you touched on the humility of Kunti and Devaki. Yeah. You touched on Devaki's knowledge of Krishna's position, which he's demonstrating in our prayers. Yeah. How can you, if you're humble, and you know Krishna's position, want him as your son. It would be like going to, you know, like the What was the last of, part you... you how would you, if you're humble, and you know Krishna's position, how can you declare that you want him as your son? Which she did, so, you know, that's her position. She wants Krishna as her son. It, it would be like going to the head of a company somewhere, and you're a humble sweeper of the company, and you say, I want you to be my friend. You demand that he becomes your friend or something like that. Well, it, it, it seems you know, incongruous. You know, on that stage, I, 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 I'm not so realized. <laughs> But my understanding is that it's devotion. Devotion overrules. I mean, let's just do it the other way. And after Kardamamuni underwent, according to the instruction of Lord Brahma, he underwent austerities to have qualified children. He was a, a bhakta. And his Vishnu bhakti was so strong, Lord Vishnu came and said, I'll become your son. Because it was Vatsalya. He wanted Krishna, Vishnu as his son. He wanted Vishnu as his son. Bhakti. And after he was of age to take care of Devahuti, he left. That's a puzzle, isn't it? Why did he leave? To go do what? You know, meditate on Vishnu. And that, there he is, as his son. You just <laughs> meditate on your son. But he was setting an example. So the, there, there's, there's, for those persons who are in such a level of, this is my understanding, they're not governed by rules like we're governed. And that's my answer to your question. You know, and it's, it's, it's truly inexplicable. It's, 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 a, it's a devotion guided way of life. Yes. Thank you, Maharaj. Uh, you mentioned that uh, Devaki was not uh, some Muni. Uh, but uh, the question arises, by whose mercy did she develop this bhakti that we're hearing in her verses, in her prayers? Well, Krishna answers that. It doesn't say who was the spiritual master of uh, Prishni and Sutapa. But during three, because Krishna comes and says three lifetimes ago, that's who you were. And then now I'm coming for the third time. So somewhere for certain, I don't know who, the name of you know, the, the, the person guiding Suttapa and Prishni, but for sure there was someone. And that bhakti endured through those three lifetimes. Bhakti doesn't erode. It's, it's eternal. So someone, someone guided them. Yes? It is essential for a non Krishna to have transcendental knowledge. It's essential. Yes, essential. Uh, I'm looking at the painting up there, and we have Lord Chaitanya with the learned Brahmanas on the back, and then we have the poor... Uh, humble man who doesn't even know how to read his ah, books that one. upside down. So uh, almost about the same thing, I was just thinking, uh, is this just causally like mercy? Like question? Yeah. 
Yeah. It, causal, it appears like causeless mercy because Kunti, um, Devaki, she displays a, a lot of humility there, so much that it bewilders. It's bewildering. It's bewildering. And then at the same time, like, yes, how did she get that? But I was thinking also that that was, isn't it that previous birth? That was in her previous birth when she was actually, I, I want you as my son. Well, the, the seed of bhakti comes from one who's carrying it and they pass it on. So at some point in time, that fellow and anybody else you, you can identify that has transcendental knowledge, circling back around to the point that you made at the beginning, anyone that has that, one can know they received that seed. Because transcendental knowledge is incomplete without devotion. And just another little sharing. Um, it has come from our weekend in Chicago on Sharanagati, but there's a section in Bhakti Sandarbha, I think it's 286, Bhakti Sandarbha, where Jiva Goswami treats Sharanagati. He calls it Sharanapati. And the, the final verse that he cites in that section, similar to the one that he starts with, is, a, is from, it's, re, it's responsive to your question. <laughs> he says, uh, it's the Uddhava Gita section, 11th canto, I think it's chapter 27, where Uddhava says, this power of discriminating matter and spirit and any other intellectual capacity is simply useless if it doesn't bring one to the position of shelter of your lotus feet. And so your lotus feet to me are everything. You know, Mami kam sharanam. So where did Uddhava get that? Well, Uddhava got it directly from Krishna. <laughs> and that fellow got it from somewhere. Maharaj, if you allow me to, I'm just looking at some verse in the Kata Upanishad, and maybe you can tie up this if you want to. It says like this, the Supreme Lord is not attained by expert explanation, by vast intelligence, not even by much hearing. He's attained only by one who he himself chooses. To such a person, he manifests his own form. Such a person manifests his own form. His own form. So Voss wants to add something. He's inspired. Either that or he's stretching. Doing some yoga asana. Thank you for a nice class, Maharaj. Uh, I was just thinking with all these questions, and I caught my own, such a Prabhu. But what, what about in the fourth canto, where Dhruva Maharaj is only five years old, and he went to the forest. Uh, his mother is actually his guru. But he went to the forest, and she wasn't very intellectual either. But I think that uh, going to the forest, he met Narada Muni. That's the issue. That's the, and, and so that could have happened here. And, and then, but he didn't know how to really pray to uh, Lord Vishnu until Lord Vishnu touched him. When Lord Vishnu touched upon his head with the conch shell, then he began to recite these incredible you know, prayers. So here, you know, Vishnu, he's touched Devaki. I mean, you know, he's actually touched her. Uh, he came from her, so he touched her. And uh, from that, she was able to just be eloquent in her speech and glorification of the Lord. Yeah, that's nice. Well, the, the, back to Nikatma's question, how did she get to the position of Devaki where Krishna touched her? Well, they performed so many austerities that they wanted Krishna as a son. But how did they know to do that? That was his question. Yeah, probably somewhere the guru. Somebody. <laughs> Some really kind yeah. <laughs> Vaishnav said, that would be good for you. And they took it to heart. And for a long time, they underwent great austerities. Krishna became their son. The kindness of, the, the seed is from a Vaishnav. Okay, thank you very much. Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai.